Hello and welcome to episode 21 of Game of Wines, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast. I'm Olivia. I'm Gabby. And I'm Chris. And today we will be discussing John chapter 3 in A Game of Thrones, so make sure you have read before listening. And I just want to say before we start, thank you guys so much for hanging in with us last week. Um, it was crazy for all three of us to fit it in our schedules and coordinate with the holidays coming up and stuff so thank you for understanding yes. why we had to skip last week absolutely and we hope that everyone was able to celebrate christmas happily healthily with friends family or whatever so. holiday you celebrate exactly yes. yep so today's news um and this is comes from we got it covered.com but it's been on several other news sources so a few months ago um i had said that the creators the two guys that made game of thrones the show that put all the episodes together. They were doing something on Netflix. Now, I guess it's been paused because one of the executive producers for it has been murdered. It was one of the executive producers, his name is, what did I say? It was Z Lu or something. Mm-hmm. He was hospitalized because he was poisoned and then he died. So Jeez. it's suspected murder at this point. That's insane. I just feel like so. that's like... <sighs> Do they know if it's like... I don't know. Uh, it sounds like it's in another country, so I don't know if it's... Like, was there a specific reason or anything? I um, didn't see it. Not in the article. Man. Hmm. A lot more articles are coming out. That's crazy. Interesting. <laughs> so, the Martin message, um, he posted December 21st. It was just a quote. It is, there is nothing to write. All you do is sit down at a typewriter and bleed. By Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> so that was it <laughs> which is funny but we don't we still don't have uh when's the winter yeah yeah okay. Come on. okay come on for sure yeah um so we have answers from the discussion questions from last episode um the first question was would you have taken the same approach as cat in sneaking around king's landing christian says he wouldn't have she is essentially royalty, and it would cause a huge uproar if anything would have happened to her in King's Landing. I guess I, I didn't that. really think about that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if you really think about like, I mean, if she were to get hurt or something, it would probably be, like, a huge yeah. scandal. Yep. Yeah. She's yeah. trying to protect her. Um, Hannah said, if I didn't want anyone knowing who or where I was or that I was even there, then, yeah, I would sneak around. Which is essentially what Catelyn was trying to do, so. Um, Lexi said, yes, because she doesn't know who to trust at this point. If someone is trying to kill her son, someone could be trying to kill her too. It is just safer. Yeah. Which is, yeah, that's fair. She's looking out for herself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Clayton said, if I had to, I would sneak around, but if I could avoid it, I wouldn't sneak around. Fair Mm -hmm. enough. Mm -hmm. Um, And Emily (coughs) said, no, I think it's a bit risky since she is high profile. So I think this is the most divided that we've been yeah. in a question before. Because Christian said he wouldn't have. Hannah said yes. Lexi said yes. Clayton was in between. Yeah. And then Emily said no. So that was two and two with Clayton in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. It's so. just... I feel like that whole situation is could go either way. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's... That's crazy. It's a risky situation. <laughs> yeah. To yeah. So, um, the second question was, do you think Little Littlefinger is justified in having Kat brought to the castle, or should he have gone to her? Um, Christian said, maybe not justified, but I don't blame him for bringing her, bringing her there. He is safer in the castle, and there is less suspicion on him that way. Mm-hmm. Which, yeah. I didn't think about that. And as we'll learn more on, like, Littlefinger is very looking out for himself yeah so that makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. to bring that up about his character yeah yeah um hannah said he should have gone to her for sure (laughs) and i feel like that's kind of that would have been the good friend thing to do (laughs) yeah that's what we were saying yeah yeah Yeah. um lexi said i think that little finger's approach was wrong and it would have definitely been better to do it a different way okay Mm -hmm. fair enough fair enough clayton said i think it's safer in the castle so that's probably what i would have done if i was him Mm mm-hmm Fair enough. Um, and then Emily said, probably safer to bring her in the castle, but I still think he would have he would be more justified to go to her. It feels a little like betrayal. A little bit. This one was pretty split too. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow. We're getting to the we're a lot of situational the, stuff. So. Yeah. We're getting into the This is like controversial good stuff. stuff. Yeah. Controversial stuff. All right. And then the <clears throat> third question was if Ferris knows everything, do you think he knows who pushed Bran? Mm-hmm. Um, Christian said to actually know, probably not, but his intuition probably gives him the right idea. He knows the ins and outs of the Lannisters and what they are capable of. That's a very good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hannah said, if he actually knows everything, then I'd say yes. But who knows? Maybe he's faking everyone out and he's just a good guesser. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That I think he's able to put it funny. together yeah. better since he I knows what it's in pieces. Him yeah. That he would do that. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if he just hears from, hears bits and pieces from here and there, yeah. probably. I mean, it would make sense. Yeah. Um, Lexi said, I've never thought about that. It is possible, which makes me think that it's also possible that Littlefinger knows, and I wouldn't put it past him, so yeah, Varys probably knows or has some idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's sounding like everyone's agreeing that he doesn't know for sure, but he has an idea. He has an idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Clayton said, he may not know with hard proof, but it's, he likely is pretty sure in his assumption of who it is. Again, another assumption, Yep. yep. Um, and Emily says he probably knows, but also knows it would cause a lot of problems if he said it out loud. True. Yeah. As Catelyn said, too. I mean, that's why she's being so secretive. Yeah. So. Exactly. So, with that, um, last episode, we were with Cat in King's Landing, um, where we got to feed, bleh, where we got to meet a few new characters, including Lord Peter Baelish and Lord Varys. Um, we also found out who the dire belonged to, the imp. Tyrion Lannister. Yes. Uh, today we're at Castle Black. John is learning to get along with other bro- brothers of the Night's Watch, and I say get along in quotations, <laughs> um, with the help of Tyrion and some new characters that are added into the mix here. Um, and he gets some good news that's delivered to him. Cool. All right, so this week for wine, it's a little bit different. Um, Olivia and I were out at the liquor store, and we found these... I don't know, they're little, almost like, have you guys seen those buzz balls? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the That's buzz ball. That's kind of what I thought of when I saw them. Yeah, so it's like a little ball with of, a little top that you peel off. Yeah, and it's Woodbridge Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. So it's, but they're little, they're their own little individual glasses in one. So there's no pop today. Yeah, sorry. No. But I do have something new for you guys. Yeah. We actually are starting two new segments as of this episode. So the first segment you're going to get right now, second one is going to be at the very end before we say goodbye on our podcast. So our new segment is is a wine rule. So we're going to do one wine rule for each episode. It is from a book that my Aunt Katie got me and Chris. It is called The New Wine Rules by John Bonn. I think it's Bonn or Bonnet. I'm not sure. But Why I will... Bonnet? <laughs> Bonnet. <laughs> I will post a link of the book. It is so cool. It has, um, it has one wine rule for each day. There's different segments of it. It gives you, like, instructions and, like, different charts and stuff. Really, really cool. Um, so... The book is split up into eight different sections. The first section that we will be focusing on for the next many episodes is called the basics. So, rule one of the basics is to drink the rainbow. The author says that the world of wine today is more diverse than it has ever been, and most wine drinkers don't take advantage of it. Wine drinkers are creatures of habit, so if you find a brand of Chardonnay that you like, you are more likely to keep on buying the exact same wine and the exact same brand, unless someone gives you a good reason to switch. People don't usually switch their wine type out of fear and because they are afraid to try something that is not familiar to them. This causes us to be narrow-minded when trying new wines, but the world of wine is ever-changing and there are so many options out there for us to try. So, just like we are told to eat the rainbow when we are trying to kind of change up our diet, the same applies to wine. So instead of eating the rainbow, we should drink the rainbow. There are so many different styles of wine. Um, So, for example, the author said, white wine isn't just white anymore. It could be pale green or deep yellow, just for example. 
There are hundreds of different grapes that can be made into different ways and hundreds of different, different styles of winemaking that makes each type uniquely different. So the author stated that this book is kind of a framework for traversing the insanely diverse world of wines. So I, I think this is a good segment for our podcast because we are Game of Thrones, but we are also about wine. So mm-hmm. I'm hoping that this will bring in more of the wine aspect for you guys so so guys try your chardonnay yes Mm -hmm. i think it's actually so this isn't really going off of this rule it's not really white it's It's like a golden yellow yeah so it's good yeah i think it's pretty good that's good it's not very tart or anything it's kind of watery yeah yeah but yeah i'm excited about that it's not bad I think it'll... We're definitely not wine experts, so this is going to help us as well. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Are we ready? I think we are. Okay. Here we go. All right. So, (laughs) John is at Castle Black, and he is sparring in the courtyard with a fellow member of the Night's Watch, Gren. So, Gren is one of the new characters we're going to meet today. He is described as having a thick neck. He is a head taller than John, and he is almost 16 years old. Gren is mocked for his looks and for not being the smartest, and his nickname is Arox. I looked up what Arox meant, and it is large wild cattle. So that's a kind of a mean nickname, but... He does have a thick neck. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it doesn't seem like a good compliment. Either. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So the sparring match. John presses his attack against Gren, and he stumbles backwards, clumsily trying to defend himself. And then Gren raised his sword, and John went under it and whacked the back of his leg. Then Gren tried to bring his sword down, but it was answered by John with a hit to Gren's helmet. Then Gren tried to sideswipe John, but he slammed his arm into Gren's chest, and then he fell to the ground. John knocked his sword out of his hand with a slash to Gren's wrist, which made him scream out in pain. And at the moment that Gren screamed out in pain, Sir Alistair Thorne screamed enough, which brought the sparring match to a halt. So I wanted to talk about Sir Alistair Thorne. Um, He's kind of an important character. He he is the Master at Arms of the Night's Watch. So the Master at Arms is responsible for the training of soldiers in a castle, in this case, Castle Black. Um, And then during wartime, the Master at Arms is involved in leading the defense of the castle along with the captain of the guards and the lord himself. Um, Alistair is described as being bitterless and humorless. Um, He's particularly hated by the recruits that are trained by him. He is described as being slim but muscular, 50 years old, black eyes and black hair streaked with gray, and he has a hard demeanor. And he has a thin smile and a sharp, cold voice. So that's... That's Alistair for you. <laughs> um, so after Thorn halts the match, Gren cries out, The bastard broke my wrist. Then Alistair kind of goes off on Gren here. Um, I'm going to read from page 176. The bastard hamstrung you, opened your empty skull, and cut off your hand. Or would have if these blades had had an edge. It's unfortunate you... For you, that the watch needs stable boys as well as rangers. Sir Alistair gestured to Jaren and Toad. Get the Oryx on his feet, and he has he has funeral arrangements to make. So Alistair kind of seems like a really tough instructor. And like they said, not a very pleasant person to be around. He's a brutal man. Yeah. yeah. So um, after Alistair kind of goes off on Gren, John took off his helmet and was taking a moment to celebrate his victory to himself. He was leaning on his wooden sword and breathing in the cold air. Alistair then comes up to John and says, That is a long sword, not an old man's crane. Are your legs hurting, Lord Snow? Um, And Lord Snow was a mocking nickname that was given to John by Sir Alistair the first day he arrived at Castle Black. Um, Now everyone calls him this. And I looked up a little bit more on it. It's kind of mocking the fact that John is a bastard, even though he grew up in a right. noble home. Snow yeah. is the last name for bastards. Yes. And then Lord, because he's a lord. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a mean nickname that he was given. It's demeaning. It's demeaning, yeah. He was trying to remind John of his place in 
the Night's Watch, but yeah. I get so, it. <laughs> still, it's just, just it's not mean. very nice. No, it's I mean. He's like a drill instructor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. John said no and put his wooden sword back into his sheath. Then Alistair presses John again and said, tell me the truth. What's going on? Because I think Alistair at this point was kind of seeing through him. I feel like John was putting on kind of a face trying to show he was like tougher Mm -hmm. than he is. Um, John said, he kind of sighed. He said, I'm tired. Alistair said, no, what you are is weak. And John said, I won. Alistair said, no, the Oryx lost. So a different way of looking at it. Even though John's happy he won. Um, still got to remember one of your brothers lost. Yep. So, um. but John held his tongue after this comment because he knew better than to retaliate. He was frustrated because he had beaten everyone Alistair had sent his way, but it got him nowhere. Thorn was particularly hard on John compared to the rest of the recruits also. Um, then Alistair dismisses the recruit saying, that will be all. I can only stomach so much ineptitude any one day. If the others ever come for us, I pray they have archers, because you lot are fit for nothing more than arrow fodder. Ouch. I I mean... (laughs) He's just mean. (laughs) Yeah. But he's molding them. That's... I I understand that. I just think he has... He needs a different language. (sighs) When he talks to his recruits. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. Dang. It's just a little brutal. I get he's trying to, like, toughen them up, but at the same time, you're still trying to, like, build a family with these new recruits, you know? Right. They Become brothers. brothers. But I think it is, it is, it's militaristic. It is, in for sure. In the fact sure. where they will come together over their hatred of him. It's kind of like the military today, like, where you go through, like, losing your identity, mm-hmm. you know? Right. And they have to be cold-hardened exactly. warriors, and that's what he's making them yes. into be by being, yeah. you know, they can't. They have to be able to deal with it. Because your identity is stripped. Yep. You know? So, I get it. Damn. But it's still harsh to hear. Yeah. I wonder if that's why he calls him Lord Snow. Like, it is insulting, but then also he's... At the same time. John has to strip his lordship of himself. He has to... Yeah, because he becomes a different person. He becomes a brother of the Night's Watch. I wonder why he's doing that. So, John and the rest of the recruits start walking back to the armory, but um, John was kind of walking separate from them. He was walking alone instead of with the group. Uh, He stated that he often walked alone because most were a couple years older than him, but John was a better fighter. So, it was, I feel like it was kind of insulting to the older guys that there's this younger kid that's beating all of them. Yeah. (laughs) And is a better Mm -hmm. fighter. Um, He said that the more John got to know them, the more he despised them. He ignored everyone as they entered the armory. He started to hang up his sword and scabbard and took off his armor. And he said, he made a comment about the climate of the wall. He said, even though there were small fires all around, John was still shivering. He was always cold and would soon forget what it was like to be warm. And I think that's crazy that he thinks that Winterfell is warm. Yeah. Everyone else Mm. thinks it's like cold, cold as heck. But yeah, well, then they talked about like the. How the walls were warm. Exactly. Yeah. There was, like, yeah. hot springs the going hot through springs. Winterfell. But, like, I just think it's funny because the people from the south came to visit Winterfell and said, oh, my gosh, it's so cold. How do you ever get used to it? <laughs> Go to the wall. And then John <laughs> goes to the wall and he's like, I'm cold and I come from Winterfell. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't know what cold is. Exactly. So then he, after he took off his armor, he put on the everyday wear of the Night's Watch, which was a rough spun black wool cloak. He was remembering that um, no one really told him what the Night's Watch was actually like except for Tyrion Lannister. He wondered if his dad knew what it was like and said that he must have. And John commented that he was very hurt by this, that his own father wouldn't tell him the truth about it and wouldn't warn him about what he's getting into. Which I feel like Ned, like, not wanting him to go to the wall, like, being very adamant that he wait. Yeah. Was kind of, should have been a warning to John. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's fair of him to say that. Every, that is, every, I mean. Everyone told him. Yeah. Yeah. And even Ned was saying, don't, like, he didn't want him to go. Yeah. And so I think there was John. a little bit of an ego with John, too. Like, everyone was saying, you're not a man yet, you're not a man yet. And John wanted to prove that he was yep. kind of thing. Yeah. Agreed. So, yeah. 
He felt, he went on and said he felt abandoned by his uncle Benjamin, who spoke, who spent most of his time with the Lord Commander and Maester Eamon, while John had to be in the care of Sir Alistair. So he's kind of throwing a fit about how he's being treated, and even though he's, his uncle is Uncle Benjamin, who's the first ranger. Don't matter, John. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, then he says, at three days after John's arrival, Benjamin was to lead a half dozen men on a ranging into the haunted forest. John sought out his uncle in the common hall before he left and begged to go with him. Benjamin refused him right away and said, on the wall, a man gets only what he earns. You're no ranger, John, only a green boy with the smell of summer still on you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. John argued back and said he will be turning 15 soon and that he was basically a man already. Benjamin said, no, you're a boy and you'll remain a boy until Alistair says you are fit to be a man of the Night's Watch. And then he goes on to say that John was wrong if he thought his Stark blood would get him any favors. So again, like we were saying before, um, he thought since he came from a noble house, he would be treated differently. Mm-hmm. You know, even though wrong that's again. not the case. Yeah. It's, you got to earn your place here. You know, which I was, I feel like that was told. It was also told you know? to him. Yep. Yeah. I think Tyrion said something like that. Too. Yeah. And then Benjamin goes on and says that brothers of the Night's Watch cut ties with their old families when they take their vows and then they gain new brothers and a new family, which would be your fellow brothers of the Night's Watch. So that's again, that's another place we see like a stripping of your identity, you know? Mm-hmm. So the next day, John woke at dawn and watched his uncle leave. Benjamin was not happy to see John there. And all he said was, we will speak when I get back. And with Benjamin gone, he truly felt loneliness creep up on him. He sought after Ghost, gave him a big hug, and buried his face (laughs) in his fur. He decided to make solitude his armor. He couldn't find it in him to pray to any gods. He was angry and doubted their existence, saying if they were real, they were cruel. He was missing his family a lot. Um, He said he missed Rickon and his bright, shining eyes. Rob, his best friend and companion. Bran, stubborn and curious and always wanting to hang out with John and Rob. (laughs) He said he missed his sisters too, but he missed Arya more than anyone. And I love this part because it just shows more of how close Arya and Rob or Arya and John were Mm -hmm. so cute he was reminiscing about how skinny she was with her knees always scraped up tangled hair torn clothes and she was always so fierce she could always make John smile um he felt a connection to her because they were both parts of the family that could never really fit in all he wanted was to mess up her hair and watch her make a face and finish each other's sentences oh how cute how cute (laughs) And then Gren comes up, interrupting his thoughts, and said, You broke my wrist, bastard boy. John looked up and saw Gren standing over him with three of the other recruits. There was Totter, everyone called this guy Toad, because he was short and ugly with an unpleasant voice. (laughs) That's kind of funny. I know. (laughs) Then there were the two other ones um, that Yorin had brought to the Castle Black with John and Tyrion. John had forgotten their names, but all they were were brutes and bullies. Um, so then, John stood up and told Gren that he would break the other one for him if he would ask nicely. <laughs> um, oh, even though Gren was 16 and a head taller than him, um, John really wasn't scared of Gren. He wasn't scared of any of them, and he had beaten all of them in the yard. Mm-hmm. Um, so, that kind of shows his ego. For sure. Um, so... One of the boys then say, maybe we'll break you to John, which he replies, try. Um, John reaches for his sword, but then one of his one of the guys kind of grabs his arm and twists it up behind his back. Um, Toad complained that John makes them look bad, but John tells them that they, they look bad before that he had ever even met them. <laughs> wow. So burn, John. Yeah, burn. <laughs> so, um... After he said that, the boy who had John's arm jerked it upward on him and pain shot through him, but he would not cry out. Obviously didn't want to give him the benefit, the, the, the satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, Toad then steps closer to John and says, the little lordling has a mouth on him. Is that your mommy's mouth? 
bastard. What? <laughs> Wow, it's so rough there. Sorry. Um, What was she? Some whore? Tell us her name. Maybe I had her a time or two. My gosh. That's so. I just think that's gross. They're, yeah. Yeah. They're Um, being mean. This is. Just. There's mean people in this chapter. Yeah, dude. (laughs) My Um, gosh. So obviously, John is enraged by this and twists around like an eel and slams his heel down across the instep of the boy that was holding him. So. Obviously, s- slammed his foot down on on the kid's foot pretty hard. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, so the boy cries out in pain, and John is suddenly free. Um, he then went after Toad, knocking him backwards over a bench, um, landing on his chest with both of his hands around his throat. Jeez. And was also slamming his head against the packed earth. That's... That's intense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the two boys from the fingers pulled John off, throwing him roughly to the ground, and Gren began to, Gren began to kick at him, and John was rolling away from the blows when a voice cut through the armory. So, Donald Noy, Noye? I don't really know how to say it. I don't either. I'm gonna say Donald Noy. Okay. We'll go with that. Um, <laughs> stood glowering over them and said, stop this now. So I looked up who Donald Noy was because I didn't recognize the name. Um, yeah, this is a new character for yeah. us too. <laughs> um, so it he is formerly the armorer and blacksmith of Storm's End, which um, is where the Baratheons are from. Mm-hmm. Um, and he is who made Robert Baratheon's famed Warhammer. Wow. Um, so we thought that was pretty yeah. cool. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, he was then, it said minorly injured in battle when I looked him up. But then when John explains it a little bit later, it doesn't really sound minor. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know. But the wound, basically his wound festered and it caused him to lose one of his arms. And then he chose, he chose to go to um, the Night's Watch. Wow. So he's one-armed. Yeah. So, he comes in and he tells the guys that the yard is for fighting, keep your quarrels out of my armory or I'll make them my quarrels and you won't like that. Mm -hmm. So All right, Donald. He's not very happy. Um, Toad sat on the floor feeling the back of his head um, and when he brought his fingers back to his, like, to look at them, they were bloody. (laughs) So, he goes, he tried to kill me. Oh, jeez. Um, and then one of the other boys says, it's true, I saw it. And Gren, again, pipes up saying, he broke my wrist. Man, we get it. Yeah. Okay. And, like, holds it out for inspection, but the armorer barely looks at the wrist before telling that, telling him that it was a bruise, maybe a sprain, and that him and Totter should both go to see Maester Eamon, and that the rest of the boys should go back to their cells, but he told John to stay. A little chit-chat. Yeah. So, John sat just on a bench as the others left, oblivious to the looks that they were giving him as they were leaving. Mm -hmm. Um, There were silent promises of future retribution. So, uh (laughs) (laughs) uh-oh. But his arm was throbbing, so he wasn't even... He's not concerned. He's not worried. Right. Um, So, Noi then says, The watch has need of every man it can get, even men like Toad. You won't win any honors killing him. So, John's anger only flares, and he says, He said my mother was... And Noi just goes, A whore. I heard him. Yep. What of it? We got it. Yep. I mean, like, (laughs) Who cares? Um, So, John goes, Lord Eddard Stark was not a man to sleep with whores. His honor... And again, Noi goes, did not prevent him from fathering a bastard, did it? That's a very good point. (laughs) So at this point, John was cold with rage and asked if he could go, but Noi kind of tells him he goes when he says he can go. Um, And John's just staring at the smoke rising from the brazier. I think it's like a... Fire? Like a pyre, kind of like a small one. Oh, okay. I think that's kind of. I was, and I mean, smoke rising made me think it was some sort of fire. That's what obviously. I'm picturing in my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he was doing. He was staring at the fire until Noi actually took him under the chin and twisted his head around and said, "Look at me when I'm talking to you, boy." Wow. All right, aggressive. Aggressive. 
Um, John looked. The armorer had a chest like a keg of ale and a gut to match. His nose was flat and broad, and he always seemed in need of a shave. The less left sleeve of his black wool tunic was fastened at the shoulder with a silver pin in the shape of a long sword. So, obviously, we, he, we already know he lost his arm. Right. So, that's the him describing what the side he lost his arm on looks like. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he goes, words won't make your mother a whore. She was, she was what she was and nothing toad can, and nothing toad says can change that. You know, we have men on the walls, on the wall whose mothers were whores, mm-hmm. which is true. Good point. So John being John is just stubbornly thinking, not my mother, but honestly, he really doesn't know anything up about his mom. Um, Ned wouldn't talk about her. But promised that he would when they returned. Yes. Um, John dreamed of her at times so often that he could see almost see her face. Um, he pictured her as beautiful and highborn with kind with kind eyes. Mm-hmm. So Alright. <laughs> yeah. Um, the armorer went on to say, You think you had it hard being a highborn a high lord's bastard? That, that boy Jaron is a Septon's git, and Cotter Pike is the baseborn son of a tavern wench. Now he commands East Watch by the sea. So we actually don't really understand what a Septon's git is. It you- sounds like... I don't know. I think since they're... Since they're talking about, like, bastards and, like, your your birth status and stuff, I'm assuming this is a bastard of a Septon. Which Who, is, like, broke their vow. Yeah. I'm assuming that's what it is. Which, that's insane. Yeah. That's sick. But if you guys know what a Septon's get is, literally Septon's and then G-E-T, let, let us know. Let us know. If you find anything. <laughs> <laughs> um, so John then goes on to say, I don't care. I don't care about them. I don't care about you or Thorn or Benjamin Stark or any of it. I hate it here. It's too... It's cold. <laughs> wow. Yeah. He's whiny. He's really whiny in this so whiny. chapter. <sighs> so Noi replies and says, Yes, cold and hard and mean. That's the wall and the men who walk it. Not like the stories your wet nurse told you. Oh well, piss on the stories and piss on your wet, wet nurse. This is the way it is and you're here for life, same as the rest of us. And John kind of like bitterly repeats the word life. <laughs> life. <laughs> Um, the armorer, and he, this is like him thinking about the conversation again, him being whiny, which, Mm -hmm. but I think this is fair. The armorer could talk about life. He had one. He'd only taken the black after he'd lost an arm. He'd done all the things John would never do. Mm -hmm. And then when he was old, well past 30, he took a glass, he'd he'd taken a glancing blow from an ax. Only then had Noi come to the wall when his life was all but over. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, I mean, that was a good point, but yeah. still. For sure. You still um, argued with everybody and said you wanted to do it. Yeah. So. Um, yes, life, Noi said, a long life or a short one. It's up to you, Snow. The road you're walking, one of your brothers will slit your throat for you one night. Wow. That's a little... That's intense. Yep. I mean, he's being very brutally honest, I feel like, this entire time. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Um, So, John is then snapping at him and saying, not my brothers. They hate me because I'm better than they they are being a whiny baby again. He's so whiny. (laughs) Um, So, Noi tells him, no, they hate you because you act like you're better than they are. They look at you and see a castle-bred bastard who thinks he's a lordling. And he kind of leans closer and he goes, you're no lordling. Remember that. You're a snow, not a Stark. You're a bastard and a bully. Okay, so I think I agree with Noye because he's kind of putting him in his place and kind of trying to tell John how it looks from everyone else's point of view because we've only been getting Johns. Yeah. So he's telling him how his actions are coming off, even though it doesn't mean it that way. Exactly. You know? And I think from this, he's trying to tell John, look, you're kind of bringing this on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Start acting like one of them and not like you're better than them. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so John then basically chokes out the words, a bully. He thought this accusation was just so unjust that it took his breath away. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dramatic. The oh, drama. Damn. Wait, pause. <laughs> he then is like, well, they were the ones who came after me, all four of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and Noi tells him that he humiliated them in the yard and that they're probably afraid of him. Um, he says that he's watched John fight and it's not training with him. If John were to put an edge on his sword, those other boys would be dead, dead meat. Noi knows it, they know it, and John knows it. He asks John if shaming them makes him feel proud. Um, Ouch. Yeah. He's, he's, he's really... Not holding back. No, he's really not. Yeah. I think this is what John needs, though. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Um, John did feel proud when he won, and why shouldn't he? But the armorer was taking that away, too, which making it sound as if he had done something wrong. Which, I mean, in John's mind, he hasn't. Right. He hasn't gotten there yet. Right. Yeah. Um, he goes, he says, they're all older than me, he said, very, like, defensively. Um, and Noi agrees with that and also notes notes that they're bigger and stronger as well. But he brings up that John probably had a master at arms teaching him how to fight bigger men. He asked who he was, and John told him that it was, um, Sir Roderick Castle. But he felt as if there were a trap closing in around him as Noi was asking him this question. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and Donald leans into John's face and goes, now think on this boy. None of these others have ever had a master at arms until Sir Alistair. Their fathers were farmers and wagon men and poachers, smiths and miners and oars on a trading galley. What they know of fighting, they learned between decks in the alleys of Old Town and Lannisport, in wayside brothels and taverns on the King's Road. They may have clacked a few sticks together before they came here, but I promise you not one in 20 was ever rich enough to own a real sword. His look was grim, and he said, so how do you like the taste of your victories now, Lord Snow? Wow. Mic drop. He, yeah. I was going to say, John doesn't realize how many advantages that he grew up with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though he is a bastard, he was treated poorly by Catelyn. He still grew up in yeah. a castle yeah. still wasn't with a noble family. Yeah. yeah, He's probably a lot smarter than them. Yep. Mm-hmm. He's definitely, as we can see, more skilled than him at fighting. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, like, you're privileged. These people had nothing. Yep. So recognize it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> recognize. Recognize. Yep. Um, so John just replies with, don't call me that. Um But the force had kind of gone out of his anger, and all he felt now was ashamed and guilty, and he started to kind of say that he hadn't really ever thought of it like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And Noi just says, best you start thinking that or sleep with a dagger by your bed. Now go. It's kind of a grow-up moment for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, So, it was almost midday when John left the armory. Um, He kind of turns and looks up at the wall. And it's blazing blue and crystalline. Crystalline? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. In the sunlight. <laughs> what does that word mean? I don't know. Okay. I think it's Sparkling? A, I think it, yeah. Like, it, looks like crystal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would, that's what I would guess. Even though it's ice. Yeah. Uh, um, the sight of it still gave him shivers, even after being there for weeks. Mm-hmm. So, obviously. He's still not used to the cold. Yeah. yeah. So, I actually liked the next few little points I make because it's all about the wall and i just i don't know we don't hear a lot about it we haven't heard a lot about the wall yet so i thought it was cool yeah um so centuries of wind-blown dirt had pocked and scoured the wall covering it like a film and it often often seemed a pale gray like the cover the color of an overcast sky but when the sun caught it fair on a bright day fair on a bright day Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm Caught it fair on a bright day. But when the sun caught it fair on a bright day, it was it shone alive with light, a colossal blue white cliff that filled up half the sky. That's crazy. Half the sky. That's insane. That's really tall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the largest structure ever built by the hands of men, Benjamin Stark had told John on the way on the King's Road on the way there, when they first caught sight of the wall in the distance, and then Tyrion kind of added. With a grin, and beyond a doubt, the most useless. 
Because <laughs> he doesn't believe in the others, right? Yeah. Yeah. But in the book, it actually noted that as they, like, neared it, even Tyrion, like, got quiet and was yeah. all, mm-hmm. wow, like, in awe. Yeah. Um, so you could literally see the wall from miles off. Um, it was like a pale blue line across the northern horizon, stretching away to the east and the west and vanishing far in the distance, immense and unbroken. This is the end of the world, it seemed to say. Wow. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's intense. Sounds like a monster of yeah. a structure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, when they finally spied Castle Black, its timbered keeps and t- stone towers looked like nothing more than a handful of toy blocks scattered in the snow. Which I kind of thought was a funny comparison. Toy blocks. When you're thinking about the wall and then you're thinking about like where they're living at the wall mm-hmm. yeah it looks like toy blocks compared to the wall like that's how far up you that's are. insane yeah um but the ancient stronghold yeah i just <clears throat> the ancient stronghold of the black brothers was no winterfell no true castle at all Lacking walls, it com- could not be defended, not from, the no- not from the south or east or the west, but it was only the north that concerned the Night's Watch anyway. And to the north loomed the wall. Okay. So almost 700 feet in height it stood. Almost 700 feet high it stood. Three times the height of the tallest tower stronghold it sheltered. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, Benjen had told John that it was wide enough for a dozen armored knights to ride abreast, which I took <laughs> to mean next to each other. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the gaunt outlines of huge catapults and monstrous wooden cranes stood century up there like the skeletons of great birds, which I thought was like a crazy mm-hmm. yeah. picture that was painted right there. Um, and then among them walked men in black as small as ants. Can so, we just give it up for Martin for, like, the description? Yeah. yeah that was there. beautiful. <laughs> so John's looking up at the wall, and like you said, he's overcome with this, like, massiveness of the structure. Um, and like you said, he, he looks... It's, it's still daunting to him, even though he saw it in the King's Road. Um, and John said that he could feel the weight of the ice pushing down on him, and he couldn't even look up at it without getting dizzy. Um, and all of a sudden, Tyrion appears, um, as he always does. He kind of sneaks up. Um, I kind of forgot he was staying there, Yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Oh, he's having a grand old time, as I'll <laughs> say. Yeah. So, um, and when Tyrion appears, John kind of notes that he didn't even notice him, and that Tyrion is so drenched in furs that he looks like a little bear. Because he has so many furs on him. Um, and Tyrion, of course, with his quick wit, immediately is like, and he goes, how daunting the actual structure is, and how it makes you wonder, what's on the other side? Um, and this makes John kind of think about what he thought before about Uncle Benjen, about how that vision that he had of Uncle Benjen laying in the snow. Mm-hmm. Um, and he kind of doesn't want... Um, Tyrion to realize that that's what he's thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so we go on to like how Tyrion is actually being treated while he's at Castle Black. So Tyrion is there as a guest of honor. So because he's a guest of honor and he's a Lannister, mm-hmm. um, he gets to dine with the Lord Commander at his table Jeez. every time. Mm-hmm. He gets a nice w- room in one of the towers. Um, and he's spent his days since he was there drinking and gambling and running along the wall with all the High Lords that are there. <laughs> wow. So, <clears throat> and Tyrion comments that, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to take you by surprise, um, but you can actually learn a lot about someone by doing that. And John quickly comments that you're not going to learn anything from me. Okay. <laughs> um, you can so, try. again, John doesn't really want Tyrion to demise what he's thinking um, about his uncle. Um, so Tyrion comments that... Um, you know, as soon as a wall goes up, immediately men just want to know what's on the other side. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of the way that people work. And he thinks that that's funny. Um, <laughs> and then he comments about how, so your Uncle Benjamin's out on arranging, I hear. Mm-hmm. And again, that, you know, brings John back to that, what he doesn't want Tyrion to know, that he's scared 
Um, and then we find out what the ranging is actually for. Uh, Tyrion says that he's on a ranging looking for Sir Waymar Royce. And then actually many... So remember Sir Waymar Royce from the mm-hmm. beginning... Yep. So now they're looking for him, and apparently many rangers have gone missing recently. Interesting. On their rangers. Hmm. hmm. Wonder why. <laughs> um, so John tries to turn away and hide his fear, um, and so Tyrion kind of switches the topic real quick. I think Tyrion can kind of tell mm-hmm. that John does not want to talk about Uncle Benjamin right, right now. So Tyrion asks, so where's the wolf? And John says that he keeps the wolf tied up in the stables, um, where no one will bother the wolf while he's doing um, these fights, while he's training. And I can understand that. I guess if you get knocked down, I bet the wolf would probably yeah. knock someone down. Right. Um, so then they start to get in this conversation about what their actually sleeping arrangements look like in Castle Black. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Tyrion's talking about, like, his room. And, I mean, he doesn't say that it's, like, nice, but it's nice. It's nicer right. than what John's sleeping in. For sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and it said earlier on in the book, like, go to your cells. Like, they stay in cells. I thought that was weird. Like, Yikes. okay, it's like being in prison. They don't even call it quarters. They don't even call it a room. She's a It's a cell. Yeah. Um, so John's staying in a black cell. Um, and he comments that he's kind of like staying alone. Mm-hmm. And Tyrion says, well, there's a lot of empty spaces to actually sleep here. There's lots of empty cells where you can be away from everyone because this used to house... As many as 5,000 men with their horses and servants is what Castle Black and the Night's Watch used to have. Right. Yeah. Now it's a tenth that size. Yeah. So there's a lot of empty rooms. Yeah. Not exactly good rooms. <laughs> um, so Tyrion then says, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm getting hungry. Yeah. So they decide to go to the Great Hall, um, and John realizes that he's hungry as well. So they start their walk over to the Great Hall. And as they enter the hall, John and Tyrion sit away from everyone else. So when John walks in, he comments that he can see the the boys that were mm-hmm. um, attacking him earlier, so to speak. Gran and the other two. Yeah, and he doesn't want to sit anywhere near them because um, they still don't really like him. Yeah. Um, and so they comment, or Tyrion comments on the gruel that they're being served, um, which apparently is this like nasty stew. Yeah. He said it's got like carrots and stuff and Tyrion says something like someone needs to tell the chef that radishes are not meat. Ew. <laughs> that does not Ew. sound appetizing. Yeah. But John uses it more of like to warm his hands. Yeah. <laughs> says he takes his gloves off and puts his hands above it to warm them. Um, and before John is actually able to even take a bite to eat, um, he hears Sir Alistair call, you know, Lord Snow. Um, and Alistair walks up and says, you need to go see the Lord Commander. And so John immediately freaks out. It's like being called the principal's office, I think. He's like, mm-hmm. oh, what did I do? You know, it's like there's no way that he could be calling me up there just because of the fight that we had. Mm-hmm. And he goes, well, what, what is it about? Is it about Lord Benjen? And Alistair immediately is like, I don't need you to question my commands. I need you to just do them. And Tyrion steps up for him, kind of threatens him. And, uh, or he steps up for him and is like, would you just tell him what it's about? Yeah. And Alistair says, you know, you have no place here. And Tyrion basically uses his, like, prowess as a Lannister and is like, yeah, I don't have a place here, but I have a place on the court and I can make sure that you don't get to do your job anymore. Mm-hmm. He's like, fine. Okay. So he says, it's about your brother, Bran. He goes, oh, excuse me, your half-brother, Bran. Okay. Yeah. So he's, he's being a real, you know. God. I just real can't. prick. Yeah. So, as soon as John no. hears that, or as soon as they hear that, Tyrion immediately puts his hand on John and says, "I'm sorry." Like he immediately thinks that means that Bran is dead. Like he thinks that's it. Yeah. Um, and John shoves off his hand and takes off running. Um, and he runs all the way to the Lord Commander. It says that he even got like his shoes wet or his boots wet on his way there. Um, and as he like, he quickly throws open the doors to the Lord Commander, and you see John. Um, so the Lord Commander is Lord Commander Mormont, which we already know a Mormont. So hmm. different Mormont this time, Lord hmm. Commander Mormont, and he's feeding a crow, and he gives John a scroll from Winterfell, and he says, "I know, I understand that you can read, so you can read this yourself." <laughs> um, 
And so we thought this was kind of interesting because Mormont has a raven. Mm -hmm. And Mormont's raven, um, and I got a little thing from Wiki here, says Mormont's raven is a pet raven of Jor Mormont, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. He can speak, usually repeating a one-syllable word twice. Typically, it is a word that is said by one of the people around, but it is often uncannily appropriate. Mm -hmm. So we see that's going to happen. So he's like a smart raven. He's a smart raven. It says actually that Mormont's raven has black eyes and big black wings. Jon Snow actually described it as an old raven. That was exact the same, uh, though we don't know its age. Um, and it's actually described as a huge raven later on. It's larger. It's pretty large for its actual species of raven. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very fond of fruit and corn. Hmm. And it eats uh, corn out of Mormont's hand. That's pretty cool. And um, I just want to point out, we did see this in a couple chapters before with um, uh, the raven and corn in the two brain chapters. Right. So the two yeah. so the two things that happen here, I kind of want to point out because I think they look a little bit like some, some kind of a connection. Um, so when he throws open the door, John does, the raven leaves... Mormont and goes to the window and starts saying corn, corn, which we remember in Bran's dream, the raven saying corn, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now John reads, uh, John opens up the scroll and he's, he's like crying because he can see that it's Rob's handwriting. Um, so through his tears, he can actually see and read it. And John uh, says that Bran woke up. And he's alive. He's alive. He's and, alive. <laughs> and Mormont here is like, yeah, but he's a cripple. Oof. And he's like, but he's alive. And Mormont's like, I'm sorry, son. He's, he's a cripple. Yeah. <laughs> and John's like, I don't care what you're saying. I'm out of here. He's alive. And as John runs out, the crow goes, alive, alive. So Which weird. I think is weird because, you know, you're talking about Bran's dream before. And he was like, do you want to live in that chapter? So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of connections with, like, the raven. With the ravens. Yeah. yeah. I think um, that's going to be very important as we read on. Yeah. I think yeah. that we're going to, we're uncovering some stuff We're going to see more. Yeah. So John runs to the hall and he picks up Tyrion and he literally picks up Tyrion. Picks him up. <laughs> he picks oh him God. up and spins him around and Tyrion's like, kind of like, what are you doing? Stop. Um, Put me down. He exclaims that Bran is alive. Um, and Tyrion's pretty happy about this. Um, and then while John is, like exclaiming and he's really happy toad walks up and you can see that toad's got like the wrap around his arm and john actually says hey you know rob used to do something like that to me when i was in winterfell it hurts really bad and i'm sure that hurts really bad and he goes i'm i'm sorry for hitting you there but maybe i could show you how to defend yourself a little bit better and now toad goes, he's acting like a team member there you go yeah, he's yes. putting himself kind of at their level. He's and Toad's like something like I'll take that bet or something like that. And then Alistair chimes in and goes, "Well, John thinks he can take my job. You know, I'd probably get more luck seeing a wolf juggle." Mm -hmm. John, I think he's been around Tyrion too much <laughs> because John's response to this is very sarcastic. He goes. Well, I could teach ghosts how to do that, but it'd be tough. <laughs> and okay. it's kind of silent. Like, everyone's like, ooh. Like, he just called out. Burn. He just called out. <laughs> yeah. He just called out the guy that's in charge of us. And then it says that Tyrion is the first one that started laughing. Of course, Tyrion was the first one to start laughing. Ah, uh, Tyrion. And so everyone's laughing, and Sir Alistair is pissed. Like, he just got called out. And Sir Alistair gets embarrassed and he says, That was a grievous error, Lord Snow. Dun, dun, dun. So he's mad now. Oh, and that's how the chapter ends with uh, Sir Alistair uh, embarrassed. Boom. Got him. Cool. So, discussion questions that we have for you guys today um, is uh, Did you ever have a teacher that was so mean, but you learned a lot from them, like Alistair? Oh. Well, that's a little. Uh, no. I don't. Yeah. I don't know if I had a teacher. I think, like, I was in Boy Scouts, and I think I had a Boy Scout leader that was I like had that. A I had a teacher that I had a really, really bad experience with, but I didn't learn a lot from them. I 
Well, that's not the question. I know, but that's the thing is I don't. I've had a really. Like, did you have like a teacher that was like that was mean? Strict. Strict. That's that's a better word. Strict. Uh, like a drill sergeant almost. Yeah, I mean, I guess. Maybe at first they were strict, and then over time. Yeah. Then you were yeah. Like, okay, I can understand why they're so strict. Because like that's what I would say for my when I was a Boy Scout. We had a Boy Scout leader that was like he was a military guy, and so the way that he made us conduct ourselves, like made sure our uniforms were perfect yeah. and everything. But then when I got older, and grew up in the stuff, and like that he was you know making the younger boys do it, I was like, oh, I understand why he's doing that because we all look good, like we are respectful, like yeah. There's a reason. I mean, yeah. I get that. And to a point, yes. But I wouldn't necessarily say I learned a lot. I had a teacher that, I guess when I had them, I didn't like them that much. But then when I grew up and looked back on high school, they were like one of my favorites because I learned a lot from them. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. That works. Um, So do you think John is being too lordly, as Noy says? I think he's not. I think he has on his own rose-colored glasses, and that's is, a good way to put that. Yeah, and he's yeah. seeing it only through his privileged eyes. Yeah, I think he sees that he doesn't have to prove himself. I just think that I think it was a good thing that somebody pointed it out to him that he kind of, like, I mean, yes, he was acting that way, but he didn't necessarily realize it and wasn't doing it on purpose like a bias yeah like Mm. he so when somebody pointed it out to him he could fix that you know but even even if it was even when it was pointed out to him he was like no no like he was kind of denying it until the end yeah you know yeah Yeah. he took some time to get there doesn't really Mm -hmm. take criticism well maybe yeah i don't think so (laughs) Not in this. I think that when they were on the road and he realized the other people that are in the Night's Watch, like the, you know, the rapists, right? Mm-hmm. He was like, he thought that he was going to be better than everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of treating it like a brotherhood, he's like, I'm so different from these people. Yeah. I'm so much better than them. For sure. Yeah. I so. can see that for sure. Yeah. So the next question is, why do you think Tyrion keeps backing, c- keeps coming back to John and sticking up for him? I think that he's, I mean, he's literally said that every, every dwarf is a bastard in his father's eyes. And I think that just means that they are, they have like a connection. They're kin. They do. They, they understand each other more than other people. Kindred kindred souls. They understand each other more than other people do. Yeah. You know? On a funnier note, I think that he really likes getting a rise out of John. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think that it's more of like, I can poke at him. Yeah. And... He can give it right back. He can give it back. Because, yeah. John, yeah, John seems to be able to give it back pretty well. Because he's really smart, too. Yeah. yeah and I'm thinking that, that, yeah, John's a lot smarter than most people that Tyrion interacts with. Yeah. So I think he's enjoying it. He enjoys talking to John. Absolutely. Yeah. And that little bit about them being the same. Yeah. In a lot of ways. All right. Answer those discussion questions for us, please, before please. next week. Please and thank you. Um, so our little second new segment that we are going to add is the Tyrion tidbit and it's basically just a quote yeah so it's a there's a book that was made um that just compiled all of the awesome Tyrion quotes it's like 163 pages long there's a (laughs) pdf I found there's a book you can buy but um yeah, that's where we're pulling it from. And so. I love Tyrion. Yes. Um, so the first quote that we have is, I have been called many things, but giant is seldom one of them. Mm. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> All right. Um, so make sure you guys follow us on our social media. On Facebook, we are Game of Wines, a Song of Ice and Fire podcast. On Instagram, Twitter, and brand new to the mix is TikTok. We are Game of Wines 1. On YouTube, we are Game of Wines Podcast. Um, And before we say goodbye, I just want to share some exciting news. Um, First off, we hit 1,000 downloads. Yay, us! (laughs) Thank you guys so much for listening and tuning in. Um, We are just so happy and thankful for you all. Yes. Um, Yeah, this is like... I mean, awesome we're just having fun. and Yeah, we're and we're so glad. glad you guys are, like, yeah. enjoying it. Absolutely. Yes. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, second, 
Next Tuesday, we are going to be on a podcast called Be Hero Fights. That's B dash hero. So the letter B dash H E R O fights. Um, we will be on there debating on what is the best cel- celebratory drink. So it was us three um, against uh, Brian and Tom. Yes. At the other podcast. Um, we had an absolute blast with them. They were so much fun. Um, they they debate literally any topic. Like, they've done whiskey debates. They've done a Lord of the Rings versus Harry Potter debate. They do debates on, like, movies. Like, everything. It's They're, just awesome. Yeah, I think it's such a unique idea. They're so awesome. But next Tuesday, be sure to listen to Be Hero Fights because it will be Game of Wines versus Be Hero. So... I'm Tune so in excited. and see who wins the debate. Yeah. It's gonna be us. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna read off their social media handles so you guys can go check them out. On Facebook, they're the letter B dash hero. On Instagram and Twitter, they are at B Hero Media. And then their website is BeHeroMedia.com. And I will post all of that on our Facebook page so you guys can go check them out. That is it for this week's episode of Game of Wines. Next episode, we will be discussing Eddard Chapter 4, so make sure you read before listening. Thanks.